this episode we'll talk about what it's like to work at a company where design has a big role to play. We'll talk about how to build well-working design teams. And we'll also talk about what it means to be a service design researcher, consultant and director. And here is the guest of this episode. Hi, I'm Fabian Segerstrom and this is the Service Design Show. Hi guys, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to a new episode of the Service Design Show. This show is all about learning from the ideas and thoughts of some of the world's best service designers. So you can use that knowledge to transform services and businesses all around the world to become more human-centered and eventually more successful. We talk about topics ranging from design thinking and customer experience to organizational change and creative leadership. We bring in a new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, be sure to subscribe. My guest in this episode is Fabian Schegelstra. Fabian is currently the UX director for digital channels at a customer owned bank, insurance and retirement fund company in Sweden. Fabian became known in the field for his PhD thesis called stakeholder engagement for service design. If you want to know more about that thesis, check out the link in the description. For the next 30 minutes or so, Fabian will be talking about three topics. What it's like to work at a company where design has a big role to play, how to build well-working design teams, and what it means to move from a service design researcher to a consultant to a director. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description, or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. And if you're interested in the podcast version of this episode, head over to soundcloud.com slash service design show where you'll find this episode and all the previous ones. For now, let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Fabian. Thank you. Fabian, uh, you are someone who's been into service design for so long. Do you actually remember your very first memory of service design? I do actually, because hmm. it was very much by chance. What happened? Was, What's the story? I was studying, approaching the end of my studies at Linköping University. And there was this new teacher coming in, a guy called Stefan Holmlid, <laughs> and he started giving a course on service design and IT. And some other people were taking it. I'm like, mm, I'm not sure. Well, well, it's something design oriented. I'll try mm. it. And I have this course, which was a really short one, and after course, like, okay, I know what I want to do. I thought I was going to be an interaction designer, but after doing my first course on service design, I knew service design is the thing for and me. What triggered you in that course that you thought that uh, service design will be my destiny? The bigger scope, I think. I'm more of kind of big scope, painting the bigger picture guy than micro interaction. Mm. So really being able to see the whole thing and building more... People didn't even talk about custom journeys back then, but building the custom journey with all the different touch points and getting the whole thing together, that's what Thinking triggers me. Thinking systems and... rather than the touch points. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And wh when was this, 2000? Ooh, this mm -hmm. was probably 2006, okay. 2007, yeah, that something was, that like was that. was the, the pinpoint, the, the, the big moment within service design. A lot of happened yeah. around that period. Exactly. Okay, Fabian, uh, you've sent me three topics and I've sent you some question starters and we'll use those to, to co-create the questions as we go along, right? Yeah. Um, the first topic that I want to start with is about your personal journey and this one is called researcher, consultant and director. What is the question that goes along with this one? Uh, for me, I would go with the how far. <coughs> Please explain. And, yeah, how far can you come in a practitioner service and career if you start out as a researcher and that's an academic researcher. Uh -huh. uh, so I started my career in service and in as a PhD student and did a PhD and that was all fine. I really enjoyed it. But then I also knew I want to do service and I don't want to research service and I want to do service sign. Yeah, you had so gained a lot of knowledge, yeah, talking to a lot of people, written, I, written probably. How, how, how thick was your PhD? <laughs> Two or three hundred pages. Yeah, yeah. To be honest, I haven't looked at it for the last five yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
So that was a big chunk, and I had connections all over the service time world. Like you know, since we were also one of the pioneers, everybody knew everybody back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was so easy to I, get a job, of course. No, it wasn't. Uh, it was actually quite difficult. I had lots of connections which I could call on. But what I noticed quickly was that, although no one would say it straight to my face, is the attitude was, yeah, we know you can research and think, but can you actually do service sign as well? Uh, so I quickly noticed that the companies which were actually the most interested in my competence mm -hmm. were rather... UX or interaction design consultancies which wanted to move into service sign and for them it would be like a feather in the hat mm. to be able to look at this. We have the first service sign PhD in Sweden in our company. Mm. So the ones I actually ended up going the first with in talking and discussing employment were that kind of agencies. Mm. And that's also the role I, I landed in then and started working as a consultant at a UX agency called Usify and my task there was to build the self same branch of the company. And, and, and then what happened? And well, <laughs> it was a slow process since you need to land the whole company. Like the first half year, year was very much about getting everybody in the company on board to understand the service sign. The mind shift from, oh, isn't UX and service sign the same thing? And uh, if you just look at it briefly, it might seem like it, but if you start working, you understand the difference. So, moving the company and then being finding my voice and talking to customers well, especially if you come from an academic mm. background, then start to meet clients and being able to sell. So from, I need this ton of references, I need this elaborate language to keep it as simple as possible. That was a journey as well to actually do that. But I would say it took roughly a year and then we started finding how to sell it and people within the company started doing things and we were actually, I was pushing quite a lot for the government jams, the global government oh, yeah, jams. We yeah. organized a few of them as well. Uh, so being involved in the jam community was also a big push for both the company that people got to practice doing it. We had, had internal jams and so on and moving in that direction. Uh, and, and, and then, and then how, the, the, what's about the, the director part? How does that yeah. fit in? That's my current role. Uh, so after having been at the agency for two, two and a half years, I felt like oh, my mission was to establish service sign and have a service sign offering. And we had that. So I started feeling like, ah, oh, my mission here is completed. What's my next mm. task at hand? And then I saw a role which I couldn't resist at a company called Lands for Settinga, which is a <clears throat> tongue twister for those of you who don't speak Swedish, uh, which is a really large uh, company in Sweden and we are starts as an insurance company with roots from 801 from the beginning. So it's oh, a really yeah, old company. Yeah. And then since the mid nineties, it's also a bank and there's a insurance, uh, life insurance, retirement funds and everything and pet insurance. So really like everything within insurance and banking mm -hmm. economy. And especially in insurance, we're really big. So we are, I think we have 3.8 million customers in Sweden and there are 10 million people in yeah. Sweden. So more or less four out of 10 Swedes are a customer in the company. So I moved into that role being the UX director, working closely together with our design director, which is more graphic design oriented. So the two of us together manage the design part of all the digital communications of this big insurance company, all the customer uh, facing and, and how does uh, service design fit in in you're now talking about UX and um, it isn't just doing the digital part sort of limiting for you or how do you experience that uh, both actually I see that having a service and background and being able to see the longer journey talking about the customer journey not only because we do a lot of internal projects and we need that service and we need that service and we need to sell that specific insurance to actually be able to see the whole customer journey throughout and think about that which the projects themselves might not that helps me a lot mm -hmm. having the service same background also with talking about all our consultants because we have a team of roughly 20 people working with design and with two people managing together that team 
So having a service and background helps me a lot there. And also keeping on pushing the boundaries of what we're allowed to do, because mm -hmm. that's something you can really see that just, I've been here for roughly a year now, and just short of a year when I started, the kind of projects end up were kind of, okay, we have this business developers who have done this and this, and I want to have a digital interface. And just during this year, I see how we are moving more and more towards service. I wouldn't say we do proper service sign yet, but we move, we do digital service So, so today. are you moving towards the front end of innovation instead of being sort of the last part? Definitely. Yeah. Is, is yeah, that the change definitely. that is happening? Yeah. Uh, so I know, for example, we are starting up a big customer insight work together with uh, the retirement mm. fund section, for example, because they see we have this much digital stuff we want to do from the business perspective. Now we need your help mm. to understand what's the most important from customer perspective. So we start with this section. Then we move on to that section. So we're actually helping them in formulating what to do and in which order to do stuff based on the service sign perspective. So, so let's try to recap and answer your question in one sentence. So how far yeah. can you come? As far as you dare to push. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not your background um, which limits you, rather what you want, what you dare to do. Mm -hmm. Right, let's, uh, let's move to a topic that is, I think, uh, closely related um, yeah. um, to what you have already been talking about. And this is like, uh, what it's like uh, working in a uh, corporation where design plays a big role. Do you, so what's the yeah. question starter? Work? Yeah. Uh, uh, how can we work in a corporation or rather create a corporation where design is allowed to so, play a so, big role? Uh, did the company, uh, how, 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 what was the role of design within the company like in the past years? Has it changed? It has changed. It's constantly changing. And what I can see, and the people who have been working there longer than me, is they've been doing a great job. Also talking to friends who work in, for other banks mm. or insurance companies in Sweden, we seem to be further ahead. But it was really like coming from my consulting background and the first big project I went into, you know, as a consultant used to explaining qualitative research, why you need to interviews rather than service and so on. And going into my first meeting, I was all prepared. Okay, I got this big arg argument for a bank and now I'm going to show them how to do it. And I said, and we need to do 20 interviews to understand this and we need to go to this part. And okay, when are you finished? That's... The <laughs> Well, they, they're not even questioning the how the we value. want to go about yeah. No. Yeah. Should, instead of should we they, do it, this is, it yeah. feels logical. Yeah, so that's what, I couldn't talk about design, people wouldn't know that, but there's such a big trust in what our organization, the digital organization does. Mm. So people are not even questioning our ways of working, rather they accept it and see you're delivering good stuff, we trust you guys. Do whatever you feel is the best. So how 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 did you create or how how was the situation? How did it come to life? Because it sounds fantastic. <laughs> it is really fantastic <laughs> and something which has kind of surprised me. And I always tell people this story: is winning awards. Winning awards. That was, yeah, uh, I used to be really like, oh, awards. Those are stupid. It's, I, those who apply for awards win them. Yeah. But what, what I noticed here is that actually they had a conscious strategy of going for awards. So we won, like our mobile app has mm. won like, I don't remember, three, four, five years in a row, the best mobile app in Sweden mm. and so on. And what's really cool about that is that that makes the whole organization really proud about, look, we have the best app in the business. Mm. And... That also shows, okay, since they are winning best in the business, they probably know what they're mm -hmm. doing. So it builds internal leverage mm -hmm. more than just winning the award and patting yourself on the shoulder. The internal leverage is an even greater asset of winning the award. Mm -hmm. So that they actually, at some point, decided we need a goal. Oh, let's go for awards, because that's kind of what happened. Uh, has really created leverage and are sh is showing the people internally within the company that what we are doing is a good way of doing things and that it should trust us.
And it, it, so my take yeah. would be win awards. Win awards. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. there aren't that many service design awards out there yet. No. So uh, that's, I guess, uh, a bit challenging. But um, I can see how people would uh, trust a department more if it's getting recognition from the outside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So winning awards doesn't have to be. It was the way they chose to do it here. But being out there, talking about your organization and letting people know what you're doing and also let people internally know that you're being recognized by others in the field as experts and being really good at what you're doing. That's So ha have kind of you seen the balance case. between sort of uh, awards are uh, can be a public prize but usually are given by expert uh, how what is the balance between those kinds of awards and the recognition you get from clients like you do 10 interviews and you, you get really good yeah. uh, uh, testimonials from clients what is, what is the balance in there um actually we are mostly winning awards where the clients are the judges right. themselves okay so yeah. there are a few big awards we in sweden which actually is pop-up service on the web page or in the app where they actually get to rate okay. their experience okay. and that's winning but also so that's actually where we see really how strong the brand is and what we're doing that we're getting customer feedback mm -hmm. otherwise in our usability test which we do once a month or more uh, we usually in such a small detail we notice it's really easy to get people in on board because they like us and then we discuss but then they usually really are like oh this doesn't seem serious or who what, what kind of company would do that mm -hmm. but so that's kind of th that's the feedback which helps us do the really good stuff uh, but i can't really see one or the other because yeah. the meeting the users is part of building the whole thing and then we get all the informal feedback which is Hey, this is really good, or this is crap, and then we learn from that as well. But and and um, where do you see design heading in the next two or three years within the company? Uh, getting a larger and larger role, in, in which is it, really cool. What, what does it mean? Uh, for example, during just the last half year, until then we only did the customer-facing stuff. Now, the internal projects, oh, we've been in a new system for oh, this right. or yeah, that, yeah, yeah. or something comes up. So we have right now, I think, two or three designers who only work on internal projects. So we actually get to help to build a system which are different kind of managers and, uh, listen, we're in English. Yeah. Uh, the people actually work with customers, the systems they're doing and how we meet our customers online. And so we actually get to help with the internal system. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a great sign of the trust we're getting. And, and do you me. expect to, to um, the, the, the word UX uh, to break out of that and become uh, customer experience or service design or will UX still be a, an important term in the next years? I think UX will be a, um, an important term because that's a term people actually learned to uh -huh. do. What we actually call UX, mm. that will change. Mm. So mm. now it's very much about the digital. I already see we're moving from UX to also what I would call service sign, but internally, I'm not going to argue with people, oh, you should call this service yeah. sign as well. Yeah. Call it what you want yeah. to, as long as you let me do yeah. what I believe yeah. is the best thing. Yeah, to. yeah, yeah. It, it, we don't want those definition discussions, so. Yeah. Uh, Let's move on to the third topic. And uh, this one, uh, I, I think we are, we're sort of lucky in this uh, episode because this one builds really nicely upon what we've talked yeah. before. And it's called building, or it should say, building a yeah. well-working team, a well-working design team. Yeah, and I would be boring in shoes to how can we again? <clears throat> And then we, how can we build a well-working design team? But, so what is your <laughs> idea of a well-working design team? where every designer gets the opportunity and possibility to do, do the best from their perspective and what the organization allows them to, because there will always be organizational stuff hindering you, or in our case, where it's bank and insurance, lots of regulations mm. which says, oh, we can't, we see, we can do this amazing user experience, and then 
you get to the lawyers and like, are you only allowed to do this because there's an EU law hindering us from doing that or this. Yeah. On the other hand, we also have cases right now because there's a big law coming out 1st of January, which gives customers more uh, access to their bank data, which also allows us as UXers or service signers to do even more. Like the bank has to come, oh, we need to present this and this information. So that's a really good mm-hmm. opportunity. So it can go both ways. Uh, but back to the question. Yeah, well working uh, design teams. Yeah. So for us, it's actually getting people to know each other and knowing what happens since we have three main channels. It's our app, it's the log, web login pages, and it's the non-logged in web pages. Mm-hmm. And especially the app and the web logged in pages, it's the same thing, but for different customer types, mm-hmm. more or less. So actually making sure that those two teams work closer together, know each other. And we have so many things happening there because one thing, the most important thing for me is that we have once a week for one hour, everybody who works as a graphic designer, UXer, service designer, or, and some of our front-enders, the more UX, UI-oriented front-enders, we gather in a room and everybody gets two minutes, only two minutes to show what they've been working on for last week. So you can't really go into detail, but that makes that everybody knows what someone else is doing. And since we started doing this half a year ago, we really noticed how much more people talk to each other right. to get to know each other. Previously, they were kind of a bit siloed. Now they know each other much better and talk to each other. And, hey, didn't you do that design half a year ago in the app? And now it's time for the log- web login oh, pages to oh, it. Oh. How did you do it? So they actually collaborate and learn from each other. So it's like about we creating go. those uh, an excuse for people to talk about the work. Yeah. It's just exactly. like cre- it's creating an excuse, right? Yeah. And, and creating the opportunity yeah. to actually have the time. Yeah. To see well, so the same thing we do with usability testing. So nowadays we always go out like once a month, somewhere in the country in Sweden, and we send one from the app team, one from the logged in pages, one from the open what we call open pages, the not logged in web pages, and they together do usability tests and test different aspects of their different. So they actually get to see and hear the feedback. And do they have that to is, do they have to bring yeah. in their experience back into their organization to share that? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So after each usability test, you go back to your product and show what we learned, and then you improve your design, and then you can bring it. And then we have uh, always all the UXs get to hear what's learned from one usability test, even though you don't work on that project. So we always make sure there's a lot of feedback going on and creating the informal barriers, because I think that's the main thing about a well-working team, Mm -hmm. getting them to feel that they actually have the mandate and power to go and talk to each other. Not only I have this project, I need to work on this, but I have an idea which might help you and that actually start talking to each other and and realize everybody gains on talking to each other. So you have more perspectives, more ideas. So just giving people the mandate to do what they feel is right is my priority. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if you look back on uh, on this, is there something that you would have have done differently or sooner or? I think I would have started with a joint usability test sooner yeah. when I started. Because actually when I started, I rather quickly noticed that there were silos between the UX teams. So that was my focus for the first half year in my, as a UX director to get everybody together as a team. And then as a next step, we started doing the usability test together. But I see so much good coming out of that. So I would have started with that sooner. So really forcing them to hear the feedback that others are getting on their designs. And as a designer, you can't stop yourself from thinking about how could you improve that. So and, and, uh, the informal... Have you changed, for instance, also something in the physical environment? Have you changed how yeah. people sit or how the space is uh, created? We have, but... Partly by chance, because mm-hmm. we actually moved floors mm-hmm. in February in, in the building. So previously, everybody was sitting very much in their own channel where they delivered. Uh, now it's we create an, what I'm calling the design island. So me, the design director, and some other designers sitting together, because we sit six and six. And then I made sure that almost all designers 
sit just around us, around the island. So it's <laughs> e- really easy for them to, hey, do you have a, a minute yeah. so we can actually talk yeah. the whole time formally? I really see how, does, how that has improved communication and the ease of talk to each other. Previously, people were kind of like, oh, do you have five minutes? Now it's, oh, can you just throw away that yeah. question? People yeah. talk. Yeah. So hearing when two people are dis- discussing the same issue, a third person hears it. Oh, have you thought about that? Or I remember six months ago we did that. So just really all about the informal and having these seatings so you can create the informal environment exactly. as well. Yeah, it's, it's sort of uh, increasing the opportunity or the chance that these kind of conversations will happen. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we could do a whole episode about this because it's super interesting. <laughs> we should. <laughs> so, Fabian. Um, I'm always uh, interested in, we've talked about three topics that you uh, provided, but is there something you would like to ask the people who are watching or listening to this episode? So do you have a question for us? Um, Yeah, how do you go about creating the slow improvements in your organizations? Uh, And with slow improvements, there's small incremental improvements, because what I see we usually talk about innovation. The innovation part of design is so important, but my current role actually see being able to do the small steps is even more important to, in the end, reach the goal we're aiming for. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Really curious what people uh, will have to say about this. Fabian, this is all we had the time for in this episode. Flew by uh, as always. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. So what is your biggest insight based on what you've heard in this episode? Let us know down below in the comments. This show is all about helping you to become a better service designer by sharing real life stories of people who are currently shaping the service design field. If this is your first time here and you'd like to see more interviews, be sure to check out some of the past episodes and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. For now, Thanks for watching and I'll see you in two weeks time with a new episode.